Veterans Coming Home is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by members of Nashville Public Television. Nashville Public Television is launching new work from our Veterans Coming Home series. Starting with a town hall, which you're about to see, NPT will be presenting a series of stories designed to bridge the civilian-military divide, break down stereotypes, and broaden our understanding of what it means to serve. You can find our stories online at veterans.wmpt.org. Veterans Coming Home is a national partnership between public media stations and the Kindling Group, a media nonprofit that is working to share stories that bridge the military-civilian divide on a national level. The Kindling Group has a team of veteran and civilian media makers traveling across the country, gathering stories along the way. We're going to watch a short video that introduces us to their work. Then we'll be back in the studio to kick off a conversation that includes members of the road team from their recent visit to Nashville. From the moment that ordinary colonists took up arms for liberty, military service has been a core component of American citizenship. And people from all walks of life expected to serve during times of war. But then the draft ended. And since, less and less of us have any real connection to the armed services. In less than 50 years, a real division between military and civilian has formed. So what? What is lost when we replace civilian soldiers with professional warriors? And what happens when stereotypes harden about who veterans and civilians are and what it means to serve our country? This spring, the Veterans Coming Home Project will try to find out. A team of veterans and civilians will crisscross the U.S gathering unflinching and complex stories. We are at Templeton Middle School. Stories of Americans who serve their country in the military and beyond. The biggest thing that's separating the veterans from civilians is themselves. The civilian will never understand. And what can you do? Follow their journey at veteranscominghome.org. When the war's over, do you think it kind of ends there? And starting on Memorial Day weekend, Watch for the ongoing release of a series of digital shorts capturing everything they've learned. Is it necessarily as much as a divide as the name makes it seem? Help us to tell stories and start conversations, to challenge stereotypes and find common ground. Civilians want to help us. I mean, obviously there's some that just want to know if you killed anybody. And begin to bridge the military-civilian divide. Thank you. Thank you, this is really important. Cool, that really means a lot. Welcome to this Veterans Coming Home Town Hall event. Our panelists include Zachary Bell, who served with the United States Marine Corps in Afghanistan and achieved the rank of sergeant. He has since worked in the local community to support veterans, most recently with the boot campaign. Next, we are joined by Marjorie K. Eastman. She served as a United States Army Intelligence Officer and was awarded the Bronze Star for meritorious service as a combat commander. She also received the Combat Action Badge. Today, Marjorie is the President and COO of the YWCA of Nashville and Middle Tennessee. And Evan Owens, a civilian who felt called to co-found Reboot Combat Recovery, a nonprofit dedicated to helping service members heal from the spiritual wounds of war. We also have two of the Veterans Coming Home National Production Team featured in the video that we just saw with us. First, Garrett Combs, an Army veteran, photographer, and filmmaker whose work strives to create a nuanced understanding of veterans' issues. And Michael Primo, an accomplished filmmaker, multi-platform storyteller, photographer, driven to tell stories that are complex and critically important to American society. Let's get started. Let's talk about stereotypes for a few moments. We're not going to linger here long because the point is to go deeper. What are the typical stereotypes that you identify with veterans, with uh, civilians? Yeah, I'd say one of the biggest stereotypes is everyone feels that you have to go to combat to be a veteran, mm -hmm. um, which uh, just isn't true. Um, I joined during a time of war, so my chances were highly uh, likely that would happen, to, but so did my cousin, who's in the infantry as well, and never happened or just whatever. I mean, people just need to value more just the idea of service as opposed to you know, ranking what they've done against the merits of others. Hmm. And there aren't any Mark Wahlberg movies about the guys in the motor pole who are like changing tires. <laughs> no, there's not. No, there's not. Um, and what about how diverse is in the military with uh, females, males, that sort of thing? Well, I think the statistic is, is that it's about 20% of the armed services are female. Yeah. Um, but just the, the soldiers that I served around, I mean, they were men and women. They were gay and not gay. They were 
Latino, they were African American. I mean, it was such a mix of people. That's the story I think that people don't realize about veterans. I think that that puts a little <clears throat> bit of responsibility, especially on the media, about how do you perpetuate these stereotypes? How do you break them down and counter them? I know Kindling Group and you know Veterans Coming Home, that's really what you all are trying to achieve with this project. What are you finding? What, are you, what stories are you seeking out? And, and what stereotypes are you trying to avoid? I mean, one thing we try to avoid is to like not start our, our, our line of questioning with people about the divide because it automatically insinuates that there is a divide. Another thing that you know we, we really try to do is look at parallel experiences. And so to, to break down some of those stereotypes, we look at what people have um, experienced that might be similar, hmm. you know, even in just the feelings of those experiences. Do, we, do you think that that fixation on combat, that that provides a wedge? What do we need to be focusing on instead? The military itself is projecting these videos and, and projecting information that is, that is highlighting combat without highlighting all the breadth of experience. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder what, what it would look like for a, had to have a military PR campaign that really sort of emphasized all the multi-layered complex skill sets and jobs that are, all, that are just across the military um, in a way that sort of begins to sort of lift the veil on this sort of very the diversity of jobs that are just at play that make the, the military apparatus move. But we can't forget that we are still at war. Right. Yeah. So combat is still happening. Right. And the type of war that we're in right now, it is asymmetric warfare. So mm -hmm. there are no front lines. And so when you rose your right hand, and also if you were a journalist or a contractor or a non-governmental worker, I mean, we can't forget the Daniel Pearls to the James Foley's, along with the 6,800 other troops that we've lost since 9-11. Mm -hmm. And what united us was the fact that we all volunteered to step up and say, yeah, I'm in, count me in. It was service, that was the common denominator. I think it's important, it is important to remember that, that we're still at war. Um, and I think like for the purposes of this conversation though, what we really have to focus on is peace because we're, we're not talking about our service people, we're talking about like the people who are trying to integrate into society. Hmm. Well, and yeah, I, I would just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I would just say, I think that's the, the question. I mean, I, I hear all the time being, I guess, the token, I guess the two of us now, to two token civilians on the panel. Um, I hear a lot of talk about, well, the, the transitioning military. And I always laugh, like, what, what does that mean? I mean, what do you consider successfully transitioned? Because if we don't define that, then we're having a conversation about something that we don't really understand. And I think what we mean is that they're thriving, that they're in a good paying job, that they're raising their families successfully, or, you know, some level of, of achievement is what we're looking for. And I think a question that we, we don't usually ask, because this is one thing that I've found interesting coming from an outsider into this world, we tend to talk about veterans as if they're one group of people. We want to put the, the veteran as one person with a preconceived picture of how he looks, right, and says this is who we're trying to help, when that's not necessarily reality. And so I think if we're going to have this conversation about transition, I think we have to have a conversation about is it the military's job to actually help people transition? And I'm not sure it is. I think the job is to train them for protecting our country and defending our freedom. But somehow I think we as civilians tend to think, well, the Army should give them all these skills to transition hmm. when I don't know if they know that's their job, right? And so whether that's fair or not, I think that's the, that's the tough thing, I think, around this, this subject matter. Well, yeah, and transition is, is certainly a, a challenge. It's a like, like, yeah, yeah could it, it could go on forever. The process of transition is, is right. life, right? Um, but is it only on the uh, veteran? The onus is on the veteran to transition. What about the civilian world? What can we, should we do to welcome folks who have served in our communities? How can we do a better job? A lot of times I get pressured to increase awareness, right? Let's, let's talk about awareness of this issue. And uh, I, I've had it up to about here with awareness mm -hmm. uh, personally. I feel like what Americans need right now is not awareness. Yeah. I think we need more relationships. For me, I was not, uh, super passionate around veterans' causes, and I was very aware of them. Hmm. But I didn't have relationships with people. But when I got to have relationships, suddenly my calling came following the relationship. And I think that's what's missing. So when we meet with civilians, and some, some stereotypes might be apathetic, disinterested, disengaged, sissy, whatever the word might be, um, I think that the thing that we're missing is they probably just don't have a relationship. And since they don't have a relationship, they won't have that, that empathy they won't have it because without relationship, it's just another media piece that they saw on a network uh, that they watched for a few minutes. 
But what he's saying about awareness is that's something that we have to peel that onion back a little bit. And you had asked about how can civilians engage veterans right. or how can we help. Um, first of all, every veteran I know doesn't want help. They mm -hmm. want to help. Right. We want to be engaged. We want to be hired. We want to volunteer. Mm -hmm. We want to give a helping hand. Um, so I think that misconception um, exists. And when you're talking about awareness, it made me think of an experience that I had um, back in 2008 when I was going through grad school. You know, it's the, you know, you go around the room with your introductions and you say who you are and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I said I was a veteran. And my professor said, did you deploy overseas? Well, by that point, I had. I had I'd served in Iraq. And I said yes. And I told him. And he said, so do you en did you enjoy your travels to Mesopotamia? And I'm thinking, he's got to be kidding, right? And I, it was, I wasn't on some like sightseeing expedition or on a vacation. So I just wanted to diffuse his interest. And I responded with, well, you know, something of the sort like, I wish I would have been there under different conditions. Mm -hmm. And he said back, well, yeah, because it's Mesopotamia and we made it a bigger mess. That's and I'm like, I'm thinking, great, I'm sitting here. These are like my fellow new students in my class, and this is the first minute. This guy's going to give me a grade, by the way, you know? Yeah. And so, and I just kept thinking, we, you know? What about we, right. that, you know, Congress, who voted to send us over there, an over overwhelming majority, or Unanimously. we, the coalition of the willing that thought it was just, or we, who put too much weight on a sole source? You know, it's all about we. And I just thought, you know, how does he want me to respond, you know? I, hmm. It was such a strange, and I just kind of diffused the situation, just let it kind of go. I do, I, I, I do think that that's, you know, a strange way to, to like, respond to an individual veteran. Um, but it does come, it does bring it back to this, this, this project that we're doing about the military-civilian divide. And one of the other things we try to do is, like, and having a veteran on the crew and civilians on the crew creates a space a container where a civilian person can feel comfortable asking or questions about things that they wouldn't normally ask somebody or saying things that they really feel or think ab about these conflicts without feeling immediately judged because a lot of times if a civilian if a civilian questions the moral the the the, the morality around the wars that we fight there the veteran community will immediately attack them for uh, uh, questioning the integrity of the soldiers who fight those wars. Mm -hmm. And those things don't have to be married to each other. The, uh, a, a veteran can choose to go and, and serve in whatever job in the military to protect their country and, and still feel really horrible about what they might be engaging in. Um, and civilians can support their troops, be patriotic, love their country, and also question their government for the wars that we're engaging in without mm -hmm it being on the blame, I mean, without them blaming it on, this, on the soldiers. So yeah, misguided, soldiers, yeah. this comment was. You're right. Well, soldiers you know. don't get to choose the wars they fight in. Yeah. Policymakers do. Yeah. And we need to remember that, right? Yeah. And so I hear you totally. I mean, I, you know, I know all, sort, all my veteran friends, you can go one way there. It's like 50%. They have a lot of different opinions about these wars post 9-11. And we'll tell you. We'll talk about them. Uh, but just, it, just come to us with that positive intention and just remember that we didn't didn't create the policy that got us there well that's no. why I actually uh, I'm still in school now and we do the round table thing and I I don't tell anybody that I was in the military which is not that I'm ashamed of my service whatsoever um, I just don't feel like everybody has to know that right away when we might not ever see again I've gone through this program and now till finishing in May but um, so it's come up naturally and because um, I like to let my me be known as who I am and then not come with preconceived notions of things like that because I mean it's not their place to judge because I mean we didn't vote on it but yeah I mean and it sounds like I mean this idea of relationships right like you know it's when we don't have a connection to each other that maybe we ask questions and we set off you know the, the triggers uh, that make us uncomfortable that wedge that divide whereas really we need to find a way to carve out spaces where we can interact right. where we can listen first and then maybe ask the yeah, stupid right. questions that we all have. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is not a unique scenario or situation. Mm. I mean, I think it's we have... Exactly. I mean, I think that's we right. have this challenge, this obstacle to overcome in America in particular, where we're obsessed with definition by difference yeah. rather than definition by similarity. And this conversation is no different than the race problem we have in this country. 
yep. and, and people feel equally as uncomfortable having these same questions, trying to understand the particular, the unique experiences of people privileged with a different experience than their, themselves are harder, if not harder, than this particular conversation. And this is something that we experience every day in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, these relationships can happen when we serve together. Yeah. Um, like I said, I've got so many friends that were overseas with me that were at the Bureau or the State Department or some nonprofit. I mean, incredible people talk about, you know, having that connection. And just last week, uh, last weekend, the Mission Continues did a project here in Nashville where you had civilian members, you had military veterans. We even had a Gold Star mom there who was serving on the 10th anniversary of losing her son in Iraq. And we all worked together. We fixed up a house for homeless veterans. Mm -hmm. You know, for three hours, you would have seen us planning and digging and, and doing great stuff. And what did we have in common? We got to know each other and we had service in common. We wanted to make our community better. Got another uh, question, comment from the audience? Okay, Quentin Humbert, I work with the families at Fort Campbell as a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. What we see is that we're still missing a population. Uh, a lot of times, even within the military family and communities, people tend to get isolated. They, they get isolated even when they are serving, even with attempts to outreach and give them those opportunities to get mm -hmm. involved. Yeah. Uh, how are the nonprofits and how, are, how is these service opportunities going to help that population of people and how do we identify those veterans and those families that uh, we're not getting to because again they seem to be turned off by the say the wounded uh, sort of moniker or sure. uh, they don't see the opportunity in the same way to, to volunteer or get involved that way and those folks are the ones that we worry about the most those ones that are transitioning from active duty they weren't able to get engaged when they were in active duty and they definitely get disengaged when they are uh, just, leaving it, active duty. Yeah, you, you, I'm so glad you asked that question because there's a, you know, I mean, the irony in this is that like we're creating media about this content that at this point almost reinforces some of these stereotypes. Hmm. We watch that video and in our own video, we never see a veteran without a gun in their hand, right? The truth is that there's not only a divide in the civilian world, but in the military world yeah. and that each experience is so vastly different that some of these organizations that are so mission centric and so service centric like team ride white, white and blue again they all do amazing stuff but they miss a, dis, a, dis, a they miss a demographic of disgruntled people who have experienced another aspect of the war yeah, i talked or have had a bad experience with something similar yeah but i mean primarily for, at least i can speak to the guys who i know who have had a bad experience in the war and they don't feel like feel like people are speaking on their behalf and you know you you bring a really good point. How do we reach those people though? Is by having a conversation like this candidly on a platform where people can see it. Yeah, let me just. I, I do want to jump out on the back last question and this one. I yeah. just I feel like uh, this is something that's that's you know I'm a very the organization I lead reboot combat recovery very 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 specific for combat veterans. So I want to make that known. But I feel like it's interesting. You look at the origin of how me and many others got into this. It started off by inviting people over to, over to our house for dinner. Mm -hmm. And so we think about service. A lot of times what we want to do is we want to outsource service and have somebody organize it. So we basically just have to show up right on time and leave right on time. And that's what we think of as service, right? And so a lot of times we'd rather have government do the job of people. You know, when, when JFK said, ask not what you can do, what country can do for you, he was saying, do something yourself. He was saying, be creative, find a need and fill it, is what he was saying, I think. And so I think the, the, the thing is, a lot of times is we, in our culture today, it's, it's sort of a, a pay to play. Like, let me just fund this organization and then other people who are much younger and less career minded and way less stressed and have less responsibility as parents and whatnot, let them go serve. Like, I'll just fund it, right? But I think that a lot of times we miss the super obvious thing, which is the person you're worried about four doors down, you don't have to be a PhD to help them, invite them into your home, have dinner with them, listen, ask questions, use your personal network and influence to help them out. And if everybody did that, we wouldn't need as many organizations, but we need as many organizations because everyone wants to outsource the problem to somebody else who's qualified, who has the expertise. And I think that's the real struggle that we're facing right now is, is that, and I think this idea of service doesn't have to be swinging hammers. It can be as simple as inviting their kids over for a play date, and that's service. It may not seem like it, but that's service. I do want to just say, that um, we just be aware of conflating how we're talking about service. There's service to the veteran community, which is one distinct thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's this broader conversation, which is this grand opportunity we have to talk about just how the average American serves their community.
Veteran or non-veteran. Veteran anybody, or non, anybody, anybody, anybody. Yeah. Yeah. whether it's like, whether it's volunteering at your local PTA to make sure that your education is what you want it to be for your children, that is service as valid as any other form of service. And I think, I think there's an opportunity to really acknowledge and understand all of the different ways that Americans participate in their civic functioning of their communities. Hey there, uh, hey. my name is John Patterson. I'm a retired uh, senior enlisted guy. And uh, currently, I uh, manage the uh, family assistance centers across the state of Tennessee. I'm a contractor, and I'm embedded with the, with the National Guard. Uh, our offices are across the state in National Guard facilities. And uh, what I wanted to do is this subject can go in so many different branches like a tree. You, you mm. can see that. But what I want to talk about is basically uh, active military and National Guard guys, because coming home means two different things for that. As in the military, I want to take care of my, my sailors. You know, that was my number one priority. They come to work every day. We teach them how to get back into the community. We bring people in. And, you know, it's everyday thing. Well, the National Guard, as you know, they come home, they get a little bit of uh, transition assistance, and they're out. You know, they're, they have 90 days to go back to work. I just wanted to bring that out is that the Tennessee National Guard does have a harder time because the support isn't out there like, you know, there's no base for them to go to. There is this sense from the civilian side, until you break in and find a way to have relationships, you don't know what to do perhaps. You don't know what, you know, what to say, what's appropriate, what's not. And so there is that hurdle that needs to be acknowledged. How do you encourage getting over that to where you have these opportunities where you can bridge the divide? I would say... I think there's a... Oh, go ahead. He can go ahead, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you know somebody that's hiding, veterans hide. You mm -hmm. know this. Mm -hmm. They hide and they can't be found. Mm -hmm. And if you know one's hiding, you mm -hmm. find them. And you, you find them and you tell them what you know. You send them where you know that they want to go. That, and you bother them. You bother them and you bother them <laughs> and you bother them. You see somebody buried in drinking breakfast, drinking their pension at 10 o'clock in the morning, sit down, have a cup of coffee with them. That's how you find them. That's how you make a yeah. difference. Yeah. And you do it every single day. Yeah. You can't stop. Kathleen, last comment from uh, online. One comment from Facebook, um, Bill Crane. He said something interesting. He said, um, frankly, in rural GA, the military experience is making people accept PTSD. Hmm. Um, and mental illness in general is an actual disease and not something to be left to witch witchcraft. So it's interesting because what I like, what I say is that like veterans are a quantifiable slice of a much larger pie, right? Mm -hmm. We are, we are, right. we are um, measurable in number. We know how many people deploy, we know how many come back, we know how many report symptoms of PTSD. We are quantifiable, but society as a whole has a problem talking about mental health issues. It's not just a veteran problem. We are just something that you can put a number on. And so I think it's, it's important that when we have this conversation, veterans need to be responsible to bring it back to the world that we live in, the world that we mm -hmm. said we were serving, and the populations overseas that we said we were going to protect as well. Because it goes way beyond just us. And it goes into um, helping to start a conversation that has a popular platform to normalize and actually discuss some of these topics free of judgment or stigma or whatever, you know. And recognizing that our that what is normal is our diversity. Recognizing mm -hmm. that it is okay for a variety of people to have different states of mental and emotional health and be able to talk about that directly, clearly with transparency and really understand that just because you have trauma or just because you're facing different levels of, we may be facing different levels of mental or emotional health today, mm -hmm. doesn't mean we're broken. Yeah. It just means we're normal because Living. this is the diversity that represents and creates our normality. Yeah, I, I mean, so, you guys, you're going to hit the road. You're going to head to another town. Um, I know you're taking these experiences with you. What do you want to come from this project at the, in the end? We really, we really, really, really hope that people can begin, um, to, after they watch this content as it comes out, that they can have conversations with their loved ones, with their friends, with their family, at work, at play, wherever it is, and really understand a broader definition of what it means to serve and really understand that these issues, like what we've been talking about, aren't solely isolated to this quantifiable 
population, but are really, these are American problems, these are social problems, these are global problems. In order to understand these problems is like an opportunity to really recognize our humanity and mm -hmm. recognize how we can un come to understand ourselves as not being so different, but embracing those differences to acknowledge how similar we, we are at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, we have run out of time to all our panelists and participants. A great thanks uh, for your contributions to this conversation. Look out for more stories from veterans coming home. Starting this Memorial Day, the Kindling Group will be presenting the stories that they've been gathering on the road. Local public media stations around the country will also be sharing stories about all who serve in our communities. We'll close with a video produced by Nashville Public Television that looks at two individuals, a civilian and a veteran, who have bridged the divide. Uh, we'll see a little bit about their experiences. Evan, you're included in that. Thank you for joining us. Veterans Coming Home is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by members of Nashville Public Television. I met Brandon about four years ago through my work with Reboot Combat Recovery. As a civilian, I felt called to try to help veterans restore community and also to rethink uh, traditional healing from combat trauma. Military life is 100% different than civilian life, and there is no there is no transition period. I feel like it's always put on the veteran. The veteran has to conform back into civilian life. When I, I believe there needs to be a little bit more compromise to say, hey, you know what, this, this guy's gonna be a little bit different now. I mean, each side gives a little mm -hmm. bit. You know, and I think for us, you know, he's allowed me the freedom to be able to ask questions that I should know the answer to. Or vice versa, he'll say something and I will be like, hey man, filter a little bit like that's a little too a little too strong of a drink for everybody in the room you know and, and he instead of getting offended he's like okay cool thanks and we move on it took Evan reaching out to me you know it, it took that civilian reaching out to the veteran because we're wore out an attitude of sort of the only person I'll ever be able to relate to or the only kind of community I'll ever have is, is that of veterans and that civilians who have not served won't ever get me or relate to me. If you really think about it, this, a, a, you've just eliminated 99.6% of the population as your friends, colleagues, workers, family members, etc. It was having a friend like Evan that said, hey man, you want to just come to work with me? And I was just like, uh, what do I wear? You know, how, what do I do with my hair? And I literally, for a little while, I just, I followed Evan around and I, I transitioned. I saw how civilians work. And most of all, I saw how I could take what I learned in the military and apply that in the civilian life. Not everyone is called to fight, but everyone is called to serve. Um, and I think that's a good mantra for civilians, that I may not have been called to pick up a weapon and stand a post, but I am called to serve our, our nation. And one of the ways I can serve is by being in friendships and getting involved in nonprofits when there's enough to choose from, you know what I mean?